You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. This is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast. And I have uh, Peter Sullivan. He's the founder and CEO of Clear Light Ventures Incorporated, as well as an environmental health funder who focuses on toxins and wireless safety. And uh, he spent the last 15 years uh, recovering his two sons from autism and sensory issues. And looks like he's recovered himself from mercury poisoning oh, yeah. and uh, the effects of high levels of uh, wireless and EMF exposure. So sounds like you've been through the ringer, Peter. I'm sorry to hear that, but I'm uh, glad you're here. You know, it's uh, it was a good lesson. I think I'm healthier uh, for the lesson, so probably healthier than I've ever been, which is great. Well, good. If you don't mind, you know, can you talk a little bit about what happened? You know, like I guess maybe first start with you. How did you get mercury poisoning, and how did you know you had a, uh, you know, other problems due to EMF exposure? You know, it's uh, um, I think it was like early 2000s. I had uh, yeah two kids who were having some developmental delays and kind of autism symptoms and you know, had some problems, get, got kicked out of preschool and all kinds of things. And I, um, and I was actually having a lot of fatigue at the problem at the same time as well. I'm working here in Silicon, was working in Silicon Valley and, you know, couldn't figure out what was going on and, and, um, was reading a book about, um, sensory and, you know, sensory and autism spectrum issues. And some people were looking at toxic metals at the time. So I, I said, well, you know, I wondered if I had had toxic metal exposure because I had silver fillings. And I had been grinding my teeth. So I, um, you know, ironically, I went into the best Stanford, the best doctor at Stanford. And the doctor said, oh, no, there's no mercury in those anymore and didn't even want to test me. And um, a couple of weeks later, I was just kind of confused. I didn't know what to do. And I was getting some supplements at Trader Joe's at the grocery store out here. And the checkout person said, well, what's going on with you? And I said, well, I think I'm going to have mercury poisoning. But, I, you know, and she says, well, you need to go talk to this doctor on El Camino right here. <laughs> she knew the the local environmental health doctor, uh, and I didn't at the time. So, um, yeah, I got checked, and I had high levels of mercury. And finally, I could talk about a lot of the things like you know yeast overgrowth or mercury and things that people weren't talking about at the time, which are actually pretty conventional and, and widely discussed now. So, um, and my kids had issues too with metals, but it turns out that you know it's it's not clear you know what's cause and what's effect. I had. Um, you know, I was also getting a lot of exposure at the same time. So I jumped right in and detoxed from metals for a couple of years and, you know, pretty clean test on that, but I was still not doing well. And so I was trying to figure it out. I was, you know, actually eating organic food and doing all kinds of healthy things, earthing, you know, doing all the stuff that, you know, all the cutting edge stuff that you could find and yeah. you know, still feeling weak and not good. And then, and finally got to the point where I could really start to feel some of these things. Like if I put a phone next to my head, I could feel it and it didn't feel good, obviously. And this was really weird for me because I'm in Silicon Valley and I love personal technology. I had all the gadgets way before everybody else. I had wearables in the nineties. I had a smartphone in oh, wow. 2001, right? Some of the cell phone designers are friends. Um, so oh. So that it, it was a little bit of a cognitive dissonance. My body was telling me one thing and my brain was telling me some, another thing. And it took me a while to sort out what was correct. And, and it turned out my body was correct and um, and not what I thought, which is I thought all this stuff had been safe and well tested and that anybody who questioned it was you know not scientifically oriented. I had you know an opposite experience. So. Uh, yeah, I, I and I lost a lot of weight. I got down to 100. I'm a 510. I got down to 131 pounds. Right. So right. I, had, yeah. So it was a pretty and it, again. So not just one thing. And it, it's I think what you'd call it now environmental illness. So I had some some chemical exposures. 
I had, uh, I was a Navy pilot. I had a little post Navy post post traumatic stress that kind of slowed down my detox um, exposures um, in the work environment in Silicon Valley, but also from a, a, um, an air force base that had a space radar right next to my work. And I was the closest building. So it took me a while to sort that all out. I also had an infective root canal, right? So there's a bit of a pile up and this happens in chronic disease or environmental illness a lot. You, um, by the time you notice the symptoms, it's usually not one thing. It's usually multiple things. And I think that's one of my, my mistakes, um, for years of troubleshooting computers. Usually there's one problem and you, you know, you see the effect immediately, but the human body is so resilient that you usually don't see it right away. So it's taken me a while to kind of peel back all these layers and get back to a pretty good level of health. Um, but that's that's basically how I got in it. And my, you know, my kids have done really well. You know, we've avoided toxins and um, we've really lowered the wireless levels. And the kids have gone from being delayed environmentally to catching up and then actually now really kicking butt and, you know, taking AP classes and they got into Cal Berkeley and Uh, One just finished a master's there and other, they're just, they're just really doing well at both triathletes. They're both on the triathlete team there. Wow. No, it's, it's, it's been quite a reversal. And what I've realized, it's not just, it's not just for health, but these are kind of key things to manage just for human performance in general. You know, they dramatically impact the the exposures dramatically impact sleep, which of course is fundamental to mental health and your intelligence, social intelligence. Let's focus in. Let's focus in because there's a lot here, you know. So there is a lot. So tell me, what you, tell me what you want to focus on. Well, I've spoken to many people about nutrition. You know, there's tons of uh, nutritional info out there. So mm-hmm. what's a bit different and unique that I wanted to talk to you about at DMF, you know, electromagnetic frequency uh, radiation from devices, from things in our home, et cetera. Yeah. That, that I haven't spoken to many people about. So um, what have you learned there? What the, what's the typical exposure someone's getting at home or at work or driving around and what can they do about it? And what is, you know, how does it affect them? Those, that's what I'd like to talk about. Sure. Exactly. Um, so most people, so wireless radiation uh, has been rising dramatically and we've had this background. We've had this natural background radiation from the big bang at minuscule levels, but it's all very analog and natural. So if you translate it into the, the domain, um, you translate it into an audio domain, it would sound kind of like white noise. But the signals that are man-made are kind of pulsed square waves, and they sound harsher. Matter of fact, I'm going to turn a meter on for a second, and you'll hear some, let's see, well, I don't have, let's see how much we hear in the background here. Okay. Here's a little, little bit, you hear a little ticking, so I'm going to turn my phone, I'm going to take my phone out of airplane mode. Okay, you hear that? Mm -hmm. Yep. That's my, okay, so I'll turn that off so it doesn't drive you crazy here, but um, that's my phone out of airplane mode and um, not even doing anything, not making a call or anything, just starting to update, so, you know, update the email and all these things. So that's with a regular cellular signal on and a Bluetooth on. How, so, did, you, how did you hear that sound? How did you, uh, what n- instrument did you use to hear that signal? So the instrument I used is uh, called the EM Fields Acoustometer. It's a it's called a model AM10. It's about a little less than $400. I think it's made in England. And it's a, it's a great demo program because it's got lights on it that light up in different, you know, green, yellow, red. And it, mm-hmm. and again, it helps people have this experience of what they're, um, it helps them here, makes the invisible visible for people. Right. Yeah. Does it translate those invisible EMF waves into an acoustic signal like that? Like yeah. you just put on. So. Exactly. And then, what we've also done, too, we've, I've learned that, you know, there are thousands of studies on this topic. There's over 20,000 studies. And no, you know, people, even scientists aren't really a lot of scientists aren't reading this. They're just making assumptions and, and looking at industry kind of industry speaking points. And so what I found that one of the best ways to give people this experience or, get, you know, teach people about this is, yeah, the acoustometer is one way you turn that on and that that translates wireless signals. But then um, we've done it several conferences. We have a 10 by 10 event tent that's got shielding material over it. It's like silver and silver fabric and it's grounded. And so you go inside that tent and we find about 95% of people who go inside the tent have a felt experience. They feel different inside. And the most common thing that they tell us, they feel calmer. Really? Yeah, no, exactly. I thought it was going to be a smaller amount of people. I thought they say that maybe like 3% of people are electrosensitive like I was that can really start feeling these signals. 
But really, we found the opposite, that maybe it's like three to five percent of people who are unaware of or, you know, who can't feel this right now or, or not really aware of what's going on in their body. So um, so that's been a really nice thing. And so, so the question is, how do you what do you need to learn about this? Um, so we've had all these man-made signals that just keep going up and up and up, and they're getting closer to our body. So we're now carrying smartphones. And I think one of the big tipping points, of course, was smartphones, which I had earlier than most people. The smartphones were not just on when you're making a call, but they're updating your, you know, you're updating your email and all these other these apps and everything constantly in your pocket. And it turns out that you know your phone's not even designed to be in your pocket or next to your body. It was tested at a certain distance from your body, and that's in your phone's warning. In your phone has like like the legal warning inside the phone on the Apple. It's like under general, geez, I think it's a general about legal. There's an RF. Um, warning that says you have to keep it a certain distance from your body and the android phone is the same way so most people don't know that if you're, if you're keeping it closer to your body than that distance you're breaking the fcc's limits and the cell phone manufacturer's limits and even those limits are yeah yeah even those thermal limits are not considered safe there are many findings showing that there are health effects under those thermal limits and one of them which is real concern for guys is um, sperm damage, including DNA damage, which is um, which can be part of the autism epidemic. There are a lot of de novo or uninherited mutations that neither the neither the mom or dad have that are given to the child, and and uh, so wireless radiation is one of the big suspects. Whether it's cell phone in the pocket or laptop on the lap. Yeah, I've noticed um, just anecdotally, like when I hold my phone in in a given hand for too long, my hand doesn't feel right. It's very hard to describe. It feels um, hot without being hot, and it doesn't feel good. And then if I switch hands, the hand feels better when I took the phone out of it. You know, so yeah, exactly. as often as possible, I try to keep the phone not in my hand and just you know a few feet away from me. But it's weird. It's it's hard to describe, but I definitely feel something. You know, I've noticed exactly. And so if I you know if I talk to most people, I can find that they do have some sensation of this, but. No one talks about it. You know, it's really not an, in an open topic of conversation, but I'm glad we're talking about it now. Um, some people feel it. I used to feel it kind of in the middle of my head. I would get a bit of a headache, but I've also had the same thing with my hand. My hand would feel kind of prickly. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I feel kind of a prickly, you know, definitely I've had the, I've definitely had the cell phone in the pocket and your, and your leg feels hot. I think most people have had that experience when their cell phone's getting hot and that's from, you know, the phone itself getting hot and some radiating your leg, literally. Um, so, but again, it wasn't it's not, just like a normal heat, though. It was. It didn't feel like, exactly. oh, my leg's hot or my hand's hot. It feels tingly, like yeah. an unnatural, yeah. weird heat. Something's exactly. wrong with this. Yeah. No, exactly. And so, one the way that um, there are many uh, biological effects. The one that is most discussed is the calcium channel effect. So, the nervous system, the, mo- the, the calcium channels are on the outside of the cells. And they, um, they open and close based on voltages signaling. And so um, there have been 26 different studies, I think over 26 different studies that Dr. Martin Paul has looked at and have found that have shown that calcium channel medicines or ca- medicines have um, lowered EMF exposure damage by blocking those calcium channels or slowing down the, the calcium ions going into the body. And normally those ions go in and they kind of signal the cell to excite and to, you know, you know, kind of wake the cell up a bit, almost like drinking coffee. But um, obviously you don't want that happening constantly. And if you get too much of it, you can get this thing called excitotoxicity where you're getting, you're, you're getting free radical damage and even DNA damage from this cascade of events. So you end up having basically the same sort of damage that you get from ionizing radiation, like X-rays and cosmic rays, um, the same sort of DNA damage, it just comes from a different mechanism because the, the signal is not strong enough to directly damage the DNA, but it does, it does do that DNA damage through this cascade of effects. And, you know, again, there's probably the most evidence around the calcium channels. It's probably not the only thing going on. There's been other studies showing different other mechanisms as well, but that's, that's the simplest one. Now, what's interesting about that is the calcium channels are most dense in the nervous system in the, and in the heart. So you may feel these these things that are happening, these tingling sensations may feel more like nervous system sensations than, you know, kind of an external sensation. Yeah. So what, um, 
I don't know. I mean, I guess there's different levels of solving the problem. You know, the most right. extreme is you know, have no smartphone or anything. But what, what are some low level ways to, you know, or easy ways to reduce your exposure? Where's like the Pareto, you know, should you go after the bedroom first because you're yeah, there we, eight hours? You know, exactly. What should you do? Like the, you know, Yeah, right? you're exactly right. So there, so in the long term, we need to, as a market, you know, we need to require safe technology that's, that doesn't interact with our nervous systems in a bad way. Uh, until we're there, and we're working on that, I, my company is investing in different technologies that are different approaches to try to reduce exposure or to ideally eliminate all harm. So um, until then, yeah, the key element is to really protect your sleep. And so you really want to avoid some of these exposures at night. So there's some common exposures. The closest things to you will give you the most exposure. So if you've got a cell phone in your pocket or next to your bed at night and it's on, you can either turn turn it off or move it away. So my friend Wendy has this, you know, she was listening to what I was talking about. She says, oh, we just it's just off and away is the protocol. So you either turn it off or you use distance to lower the exposure. So every time you double the distance, you know, the, the radiation, it goes out in its big circle. So it drops off pretty rapidly by distance. So every time you double the exposure, you drop the radiation by 75%. So if it's a foot away and you move it to two feet away, you know, you keep dropping the exposure. So the California Department of Health wants you to do about an arm's length away, about, the, you know, three feet away from your sleeping environment. I, I would go even farther than that. I tell people not to have it on or in your room uh, at night when you're sleeping. And, um, you know, it's a, you know, it's a trick you can do is, um, you know, this may not be on all phones, but mm. all I care about is the alarm. But right. I've learned on my phone, I can set the alarm, put it on airplane mode and the alarm will still work. So exactly. That's what I do now is I uh, exactly. you know, put the alarm on, put it on airplane mode, put it like, you know, on the desk, like four feet away. And then that's fine. I don't get bothered. Hopefully that works. Yeah. Exactly. Now, one of the tricks that's happened in now that, um, unfortunately, now that there's Wi-Fi on airplanes, if you put in, it used to be that you'd put it in airplane mode and that would turn off all the radios. But now you have to be a little more careful and turn off app, turn off Wi-Fi and Bluetooth as well. Otherwise, those will still be on in, in airplane mode. So that's another tip. Um, hmm. Yeah, so that's another tip. Now, there's a, a doctor out here who is working with autistic children, Dr. Toral Yelter, and she came up with a really brilliant protocol, a very simple, free protocol. And she said, just turn off your, you know, obviously, if you have any cell phones or tablets in the bedroom, turn those off or move them away. But then she says, turn off your um, cordless phone base station. Well, first of all, if you, if you have children and you have a baby monitor, turn off the baby monitor. And that's actually a really great exposure, especially for kids who are more sensitive uh, as they're developing. Um, so baby monitor off or ideally don't even use it at all for kids. We don't have any safety data on that at all. And then the um, cordless phone base station, the one, if you've got cordless phones, still a lot of people don't have landlines anymore, but if you have a landline, and it's the big and you have cordless phones, the base station that has, you know, the answering machine on it is like a, a cell tower. It's constantly emitting. So you want to turn off these constant emitters so that can go off at night, like on a timer or something um, or, you know, can replace with another landline or something if you, if you need you know, nighttime phone calls. Uh, and also your Wi-Fi, if you can turn your Wi-Fi off at night, either with software or with just a, like a light timer or something or a switch. So those are some tricks. You mean you're like your 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 router? Is that what you mean? Yeah, I mean it gets complicated because some people want to use their yeah. I mean yeah. So uh, you can turn that off at night. Some people have the router, the Wi-Fi, everything all all kind of put together as opposed, and that makes it more complicated if you and especially if you've got your phone on a cable modem and all that. So I've I've really separated those things. I've, I have a, a special Wi-Fi that I use, although. Most of the time, I really use hardwired Ethernet connections now. And for you know, rare... When, cable, at, um, hmm. when I create a device that acts as a, um, I don't know, somehow a kill switch for multiple uh, instances of, of stuff in your home. Oh, yeah. So that has been done. So there is a uh, there are multiple kill switches um, that building biologists will recommend. You can actually not only kill... I mean, they're just little remote switches that you can turn plugs, powers on and off. And I use those. So I use those... So that I'm so lazy. I don't want to, you know, get close. I just flex a button. I don't want to crawl to the back of my AV closet to turn these things on and off. So I have little remote switches that we turn things on and off. And um, I actually use light timers. I have a timer that will 
They're used for holiday lights and it'll say on off, but it'll also say like two hours, four hours, six hours. So you can turn it on for two hours. Let's say if you want to use your Wi-Fi for two hours or four hours, you turn it on, then it'll automatically go off. So you don't have to forget, you don't forget to do it at night. So that's one trick. Um, if you keep a pretty regular schedule, yeah, you can use little light timers to do that as well, to turn the power on and off. Uh, if you keep a regular schedule, some of the Wi-Fi units and routers will have um, schedules to turn things on and off in the software. So that's even freer and cheaper. But it requires you, you know, requires that you keep a regular schedule, like, you know, off at 11 and on at 7 or something, which, you know, some people don't keep those schedules. But so it's, there's different choices for different people for turning these things on and off. So so that's what Dr. Yelter has been recommending. And she's seen some pretty dramatic improvements. Um, some people will see it, an immediate uh, change in their sleep patterns on the first night. Other people will see just kind of more gradual improvements, but we've seen some pretty rapid improvements with, we've had one child who was a nonverbal autistic child who after three days of this program spoke a full sentence, wow. just, just turning this stuff off at night. And, you know, I've had, a, you know, I don't know how many people have tried this protocol now, but I'm hearing it from hearing it come back to me now. People are saying, Hey, you should do this. I'm like, Oh geez. Yeah. We were one of the first people talking about that. <laughs> So that's no, that's not really good news. That means we can move on to other things. So yeah, so turning those things off. But I've I've even I'm starting to create a list and doing even more detailed things. And it's not it's not just the wireless. Like frequently we have other um, magnetic field exposures and electric field exposures. Uh, the, you know the wireless signals have definitely been going up the most. But there are four things that you really want to measure uh, that when you're measuring EMFs and when you're starting to to do to deal with this. You know, you can play with it simple and free, turn things off and read about a little bit. But if you want to go to the next level, you, you could probably buy a meter or have a someone like a building biologist or another EMF expert come to the house and measure for you. And they'll measure four things. They'll measure the wire, the pulsed man-made wireless, ex, man-made wireless exposures that we just talked about. They'll measure magnetic fields, uh, electric fields and dirty electricity. Those are kind of the primary things that they'll measure. And, um, you know, one, frequently we'll have people who are really sick, like I was, and you'll measure three of these things, two or three of these things, and you think you got it down. And then there's something like I had not measured dirty electricity. And that was one of the final things that I found in 2009, that when I finally measured that and started manning, managing it, it, it helped. And, and dirty electricity is basically a, a these little micro surges on your normal sine wave AC power. And uh, there's a book by Sam Milham about dirty electricity. And there are some some pretty serious health effects of these frequencies that are above, they're not the normal 60 hertz that our uh, power in the US is. They're usually somewhere in the range of 2000 hertz or up to even 100,000 hertz with these little peaks that are very biologically active to our bodies. And um, yeah. All right. So uh a sample protocol would be turn off as many of your, uh, you know, your devices and base stations and things like that at night as possible when you sleep, uh, just in the bedroom or throughout the whole house. Uh, I would say, you know, actually these things like Wi-Fi and cordless phones actually reach propagate through your whole home. So you can lower the exposures by having them as far from your bedroom environment or far from your office as possible. But if, you know, to really be healthy and really, if you really want to experiment with it, turn them off at night. Now, frequently we'll get people saying, well, why should I'm in an apartment and I have all these Wi-Fis around me? Why should I turn it off? Because that was, I'm still getting bombarded by this. But as we said, it, it really, the signals really drop off pretty rapidly by distance. So the things that are in your control that are close to you will give you the most exposures, especially things like right in your pocket or right next to your head. So um, to start turning those off, um, and I've even gone beyond, you know, I've started to, to go beyond that list and the list that Troy Yelter had, and I've started to even do a kind of a more exhaustive list of things that, that can help reduce wireless exposure. So a lot of people, you're seeing more and more people with uh, wearables. So you're seeing people with uh, Air, AirPods, what are the Air, yeah, AirPods in their ears, and um, yeah, have you uh, have you tested AirPods to see uh, and regular headphones to see their their effect versus um, you know yeah. like wired headphones versus wireless? What what have you noticed there? Well, yeah, I mean the, the wired headphones you don't have any exposure now. When I was really electrically sensitive, I could feel not only the wired headphones, but I could take a like a regular corded landline. If I had it next to my ear, my ear would feel kind of prickly. 
That's how sensitive I was. So, um, so for really sensitive people, you know, they should use speakerphone or air tube headsets. Um, but for most people, if you just avoid the, if you just avoid the wireless headsets and the earbuds, it'll really be helpful. I think that's really not a good idea to have those right next to your brain, basically just, you know, microwaving inside your skull there. Oh, so you think the AirPods are uh, worse than wired headphones? Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. If there ever, frequently people will say to me, oh, well, it's just Bluetooth. So that's not a big deal. And there are some Bluetooth signals that aren't really, really not very powerful, but it's, um, but there are some that are really, really powerful and you have to really measure. And I would also say it's not just the strength of the signal, but our body doesn't like these signals. We never evolved with these signals through the history of life on earth. And frequently our cells will go into cell danger mode, which, which we're not designed to be in, you know, while we're sleeping, you're not supposed to be in, you know, cell danger mode. And a lot of activities like detoxification or DNA repair can be deferred or slowed down um, when, when, when you're in that state. So I, so I guess it's ridiculous to, to say that uh, just because the AirPods are small and wireless that uh, they don't significantly impact you electromagnetically. Yeah, no, you really have to measure. No, they, they well, I, it's no, it's not, it's not, a, it's not safe period. We, I actually was talking to a wall street journal about reporter about this a couple of years ago when they came out, he was discussing doing an article on it. Um, and he had, you know, he had the same thing. He, they asked Tim cook, they said, well, how, Tim, how do you know these are safe? And Tim says, Oh, because I use them. And, yeah. and he, and he, the guy said, Jesus, well, I mean, I used to cover the tobacco industry and the alcohol industry. And, you know, it's like, I've heard this story before. And so we actually asked one of the, the best investigative reporters in the country um, to do a story on this. And actually, I'm sorry, we didn't ask. We found out that he was doing it. And uh, it's, it's in, there's an article in The Nation that was came out a couple of years ago. And it's about uh, how big, uh, I can't remember the exact title, but if you search for The Nation and cell phones, you'll find the article. And they did a six month investigation and went through all the stuff. And it is, it's kind of the same tobacco tactics being used. And, I, you know, I, it's tricky for me because I, I see this in my industry and I'll, I'll, I'll basically say this, that the, I would say that the, the tech industry in Silicon Valley is less kind of to blame than a more the telecom and FCC and government agencies that have known about the hit and known about the history and kind of more actively cover this up. I think the, uh, the tech folks have been naive and made some pretty bad assumptions as they're competing and putting things out uh, and, and thinking these things have been well tested and, you know, it's, it's a mistake. It, it just, it, they have not been. Uh, if anything, there's been a lot of merchant to doubt activity, just like tobacco tactics. And it's kind of been a bummer. Hmm. Yeah. So I just, my job is to make sure that I, you know, I worked in that industry and I don't want to just see it to become a tobacco industry. I want to see all these things. I want to see the safer versions of wireless um, be produced that aren't biologically active. And, um, and I want to make sure everyone, and, and until then, I want to make sure everyone knows what the health effects of wireless are. So we should talk about that as well, because you may be getting exposures now that, that you may be having symptoms now that, you, that are symptoms of wireless exposure that you don't know. So the most common... Oh, yeah, what are some examples there? So the most common symptom of too much wireless exposure is insomnia or, you know, sleep disruption. So people will mm-hmm. have a hard time going to sleep or waking up in the middle of the night. And I definitely went through that for a long period of time. Um, people will also get ear ringing or they'll, it's tinnitus is the formal term for it, or tinnitus. But it, um, yeah, it's actually not really that. You're, you're actually not hearing nothing. You're hearing, you're actually having what's called microwave hearing is you're hearing wireless signals or dirty electricity or some sort of emf effect on you know it's being induced on your auditory nerve so that, and that's a little bit that's stressful and you know it can cause you know, that can be related to the sleep disruption um and you can you really degrade your mental health i think there's a lot of folks and actually and that's and there's some other mental health effects too so there's a paper that martin paul wrote about about these symptoms and so he talks about the sleep disruption which again can undermine a lot of things including mental health um, tinnitus, uh, anxiety, depression. A lot of people get, a lot of people very frequently get headaches. Um, some people will also get kind of burning hands, like you kind of burning, tingling hands. Uh, my ears used to turn red when I would get a lot of exposure. So immediate kind of inflammation. Um, what else? Those are kind of the primary, the primary symptoms I have on my website, clearlightventures.com or uh, the shortcut URL is clv.us. There's a link at the bottom or kind of in the middle of the page that is a wireless safety card. 
and it gives some examples. It gives the symptoms, some of the common symptoms that we just talked about. It'll give you a couple, like I think five or six different notations of some of the science, even though there's thousands of these, just want to pick out some articles uh, to show that there's some credibility. And then some tips on the front of the card for things to do for common exposures. So, you know, we talk about what to do for your baby monitor, your Wi-Fi, your cordless phone, your laptop, your iPad, uh, even smart meters. A lot of people are getting smart meters. They don't realize that though it has a, a wireless component. A lot of people have been getting actually, a lot of people became aware that they were sensitive to electrical when a smart meter was installed on their home. They're getting a, a wireless signal maybe every six seconds or so, but also the, the smart meter has created a little bit more electrical noise or dirty electricity on the power lines, which you'd think the power, the power company would care about. Um, so those are, yeah, so those are some of the things that we're sharing with people. Um, but you know, again, it can be not just this wireless exposure, but you can also, in your sleep environment, you can also have things like if you have a, a motorized bed or anything plugged in around your bed. So let's say you have an electric blanket or um, even electric light that's turned off next to your bed can give you a high electric field exposure that can impact your sleep. So, um, so that's, that was kind of a surprise to me about the, the, um, the light being plugged in near you. So a lot of people have cords under the bed. So if you can just create some space around your bed, there's some really common stuff that, you know, you start looking around for, you know, televisions, anything that's getting kind of into your space, again, just create this uh, bubble around yourself. That's, that's not so motorized. So if you have you know, a sleep comfort bed or an incline bed, you know, get it to the right level and then maybe unplug it so that you don't have that exposure right, you know, right on your body as you're sleeping all night. Well, what about, um, what about earthing, you know, while you're sleeping, earthing sheets, earthing pillowcase, does that counteract anything or does it just kind of put a sure. bandaid over what's happening to you? Like, what's your recommendation there? You know, I got, I had some good benefits with earthing at the beginning. I started, I played with it for a while and, you know, a lot of people swear by it. Um, you just have to be a little bit careful. Some people have said that it creates this, you know, magic bubble around you and, and just creates full protection. And I, I haven't found that. I found that in some cases it can be, it can make things worse. You just have to be a little c- careful. Um, and there's two, two things that we want to make sure. We want to make sure you don't have a large electric field in your room, which is an electric field is kind of like lightning, invisible lightning, you know, electrons basically going to ground. Now, if you're in a big electric field and then you ground yourself, now you become part of that pathway to ground, which is probably not a good idea. So you want to really, um, a lot of building biologists recommend that you lower the electric field exposures in the room and measure those before you um, do grounding or earthing. And the other exposure that can be problematic is that you, if you plug in your earthing mat to the wall and you have current running on the ground, the ground wire in your wall, well, then that's kind of, again, you're getting, that's an exposure that you're getting to instead of the nurse, the earth's natural ground. Um, You can also have just these, what we call, you know, ground currents. You can have electricity that's actually going through the soil in your neighborhood, which we have a lot of here in Silicon Valley that you have to, that's a little bit tricky to measure. And, um, but you can put a meter, a, a meter on the soil and then as you pick it up, if the magnetic fields drop off or the electric fields off, drop off pretty rapidly, as you pick it up, that's kind of an indicator that, especially like in the dirty electricity rains of 2,000 to 100,000, that you've got current flowing through the soil. So I have that in my area. Now, I can, um, so I've, I've not been using earthing recently, but if I wanted to go back and use it, I would use a floating ground, a ground that, you know, in my area, that would be just a, a it's a, a ground box that's not connected to earth or soil that uh, has a large amount of surface area in it. And the one, the the maker that I like for that is Alan Maher designs. He's a audiophile who's a ground audiophile guy. He's been a grounding expert for decades. He's been doing a lot of really interesting high tech work to, to improve the power quality. Mostly he started to mostly to, to do improve audio and to improve signal to noise ratio and audio. Turns out that our bodies are electric, and when you improve the signal-to-noise ratio, things really improve. The body really uh, can respond pretty dramatically to those changes. My body responds pretty instantly to a lot of his equipment and a lot of the electrical changes that I've made in my home. So I could see, you know, I mean, even I feel overwhelmed by you could do this, you could do that. You, could, you know, how do you even 
can people get a simple device to even start measuring, which would probably embolden them to say, oh, wow, this seems to be the biggest problem in my home or my exposure, you know, is the first best way to see things for yourself or test for yourself. You're right. No, you're right. This is, uh, you know, my job when I was in, in Silicon Valley here at the end time last, I don't know, 10 years, I was a software designer. My job was to make software easier for people. And so this, it turns out this field is tremendously complicated. You know, there's a lot of terminology issues. There's, you know, a lot of, you know, um, differences of opinions and so forth. So to make it easy for people, you know, we also want to lower the cost down and everything. So, so start with the free things that we talked about, you know, unplugging things and moving them away. And then if you want a meter, we're starting to recommend some meters on my website, clearlightventures.com. There is an EMF meter uh, section, um, there is another meter that I haven't added on there yet that's good too, called the Trifield meter. So we're um, recommending the Acousta meter, um, the Cornet meter that measures wireless radiation, magnetic fields, and electric fields. We have a gigahertz meter that measures some fields. We don't right now have a great low-end meter that measures every all four things that you want. So you might have to, you might start with just one meter, or buy, you might have to start with two meters and just play around with what you want to focus on, but definitely make sure you're measuring all the factors. And again, if this is way too overwhelming, you can also find a building biologist. So search for building biologists and there's on their webpage, it says, find an expert. You can look in your area and see if there's a expert who's trained in EMF um, exposure. Can you, um, can, yeah, can you restate the four things that you want to look for? You want to look for magnetic fields, electric fields, wireless radiation, and dirty electricity. Now, there is a, a simple book that we've been recommending to a lot of parents. It's um, it's called the Non Tinfoil Hat Guide to uh, the Non Tinfoil Hat Guide to EMF. Um, a lot of the really technical mm-hmm. people say, "Oh, it's too simplified and whatever," and it's, it's you know inaccurate. But it's it's written to the I think it's written to the appropriate at the, at the appropriate level for the right audience. And so that's a nice way to lean into it. At some point, I will try to do an even shorter little booklet um, that people can use. And I have videos. I actually have a ton of videos on YouTube as well. So if you look on YouTube for Peter Sullivan EMF, you can find some of my work. And we have an all, and, and also we have a Facebook group mostly for autism or adults with electrosensitivity. But the Facebook group is called Autism and EMF, and we discuss some of these more complex practices, and you know we debate some of these issues that you know that are controversial to some people or complex. And so if things get, get um, sticky, that there's kind of a little bit of a Q and a there. Okay. And then, you know, we talked about uh, in home, you know, there's a lot of ways to improve there out of the home. Uh, is there much that can be done or are you kind of at the mercy of the environment and, you know, the outside? You know, it's, I, I would say start with, you know, people get overwhelmed by this scenario. So I say, start with what you can control. So what's in your home, in, especially the sleep environment, then move out to your office if you spend a lot of time in the car, uh, I do have a video on cars, yeah. a lot of exposures and Bluetooth in the car. Um, yeah. yeah, you can be getting just hammered by a lot of Bluetooth exposures in the car. Some cars have Wi-Fi now, LTE, all these other things. So turn off as much as you can turn off. Ask the manufacturers to allow you to turn them off and, you know, and start to measure these exposures. So that's step one. Um, and just be a little bit aware, you know, look around you and just make sure you're not you know, working excessively near um, cell tower sites and near Wi-Fi here and there. You know, if you're you're becoming sensitive and you start to feel it, what what happens is usually people become sensitive, they start to feel it, and they they look around and they go, oh, look, I didn't realize there was a cell tower behind this building. And then they just know and they, uh, you know, try to lower their exposures and just by essentially by moving away from it. Um, Some people have, you know, have have played around with shielded clothing. Um, If if they're getting a lot of headaches or whatever, um, that's a little bit more extreme, but some people need to go to that level. Uh, Other people, I found that I, I found that if I really manage my body's inflammation, that, that, um, that really helped. And uh, Dr. Mercola, who's pretty famous in, in, uh, natural health is coming out with a new book on this. I just reviewed and he's been speaking about this topic and he's really talking about this cascade of, of changes and, and they're really inflammatory changes. And so if you can really control your inflammation and he's been using uh, molecular hydrogen is one of the things that a lot of folks have been recommending. 
And so there's molecular hydrogen tablets and generators. Um, I've done really well with actually cryotherapy. So, so lowering inflammation with uh, cryogenic chambers where you go in for three minutes and it, a lot of athletes have been using those for inflammation. And I find when my body's inflammation is really down, uh, that that really helps. And that's what some of the doctors have been recommending as well. Um, and if you have other, like I had a, a chronic root canal that, that was, that seemed to be a problem as well. So if you have metal fillings, especially if they're mercury fillings, that can be problematic. You might want to have those safely removed. Um, yeah, and look at other, yeah, look at other things to build up your health and resilience. So I, I would say it's, it's really, a, you'll see right now, a lot of things that are trending in society, uh, health trends are all about reducing inflammation. So they're, you know, avoiding sugar and carbs and things like that. And so if you really reduce right. inflammation, that's one of the tricks to help your body manage what's going on. So if your body can keep keep up with what's going on, then it's all good. Um, Dr. Mercola has also been playing around with what well, he's been playing around with himself and recommending uh, things that boost NAD plus. And, and um, what he's been outlining is that every time the DNA is damaged, it needs about, I think it's 100 I think it's 150 or 100 to 250 or 100 to 200 NAD plus molecules. Uh, you'll have to you know, look at his talks to see all the details. But so it's basically a drain on NAD molecules are, if you look at anti-aging, these are basically like ATP. These are kind of foundational batteries of your body. So your these exposures are really causing damage that's draining your body's battery. And I think that's you know likely related to a lot of the fatigue and everything that, that's going on, which is, again, one of the other symptoms. So if people, if you're not sleeping well, if you're feeling a lot of fatigue, you're getting a lot of headache, start reducing these exposures as much as possible, as much as you can control, and then start, you know, following some of these diets and so forth that can boost up inflammation and and control inflammation um, to to kind of calm things down. A lot of um, electrically sensitive people have also done really well boosting up their mineral content, especially magnesium and um, potassium. Uh, magnesium is a natural calcium channel blocker and will really kind of calm down those calcium channels to lower your exposure. Okay. Well, very good. A lot of, uh, a lot of things to look into. And um, I guess one last thing to bring up, um, you know, there's going to be people that uh, say, Oh, that's ridiculous. Or, you know, it, I know it's a negative thing, but what are some of the um, strongest negative responses you've gotten and what have you had to say in return? Maybe just one or two, uh, just, just to put it out there. Yeah. So I've had, yeah, people say, well, no, it's impossible, you know, that you're not being science-based and so forth. And, um, and they usually are, are unfortunately following an industry talking point and it's, it's really well crafted actually. And it, and it, and it's crafted for science-minded people. And it basically says that non-ionizing radiation is not strong enough to break up DNA. So therefore it can't cause harm. Okay, and that's true in the material world. So non-ionizing radiation is not going to cause, like, um, it's not going to cause paint to fade because it's not strong enough to break the oxidized things like ionizing radiation or even UV sunlight. But it does turn out that it does through this mechanism. We are, if you actually do a comet assay or a DNA testing to look at DNA damage, you'll find that. Uh, non-ionizing radiation actually does cause um, DNA damage in the common assay. And the National Institute of Health just did a, a $25 million study on 2G, the second generation of wireless, and found um, a higher, they found clear evidence that there were not only higher risks of some forms of cancer, but that there was clear evidence of DNA damage. And there are dozens of studies showing sperm damage, including DNA damage. So the science is there. Most people don't want to look at it. Unfortunately, it's kind of tricky because a lot of the media outlets haven't gone deep enough on this. And they're just they're basically just using a lot of industry talking points that appear to be very credible and well crafted. But they're actually just the same sort of BS. They're the merchant of doubt tactics. And I, you know, I had the ability to study some of these tactics when I was at Stanford. I took a class in persuasive technology that was about influencing people. And then I realized a lot of these tactics are used to influence people that people really can be, including scientists, can be easily manipulated by some tactics. Like just saying that, you know, DNA can damage and, and therefore it's safe. It's That's not a, a complete proof of safety. That's one step. Saying that there cannot be damage from DNA damage from uh, non-ionizing radiation is, first of all, it's factually incorrect because when you test it, it actually does do damage biologically. But it's only one step in a proof. It's like saying... 
if I wear my seatbelt, I can't fly out of my car, so I can't die in a car crash. There's a lot of ways. There's a lot of different ways to be harmed, and you have to really um, do all these tests to make sure things are really, uh, really actually safe. So, okay. yeah. Well, very good. So, what's the best way for folks to uh, just, you know begin the journey? You mentioned um, uh, I forget the name of it. It's to do with without a tinfoil hat. There was a book. If you could re-mention some of the resources for people that are well, concerned to get help for themselves, what are they? Sure. So, um, yeah, it was the non tinfoil hat guide to EMFs. Was a, like a simple, basic guide, kind of like a for dummies guide, but um, not for dummies. And then there's another book I like called uh, Overpowered. That if you want something a little bit more sciencey and academic, um, there's a book called Overpowered by um, the late uh, Martin Blank, who was a Columbia professor that studied this for decades. That's a great resource. Um, there are books by uh, George Carlo, who did wireless safety testing for the industry in the mid '90s. I'm forgetting the name of his book. Um, Deborah Davis, who has been an environmental health um, advocate and scientist, has written a book on this topic as well. Um, the, yeah, she has a group called the Environmental Health Trust. Um, there's a if you have children, there's a project called the Baby Safe Project. Um, the Environmental Working Group has been doing work in this area. Um, what else? Those are some good starting resources. Um, that, that should get you starting. And I, and, I, and my website, clearlightventures.com, I'm trying to point to some of those resources. And again, the autism and EMF Facebook group, some of these resources are discussed and people debate, you know, what's the best book for this and so forth. And so if you have questions, if you have questions, you know, post them to the, the Facebook group is a good group. I'm having a hard time keeping up with um, individual questions that people are emailing in at this point. So I'm trying to do more. Um, oh, and my, my YouTube videos are a starting point as well. And those should link to other videos that, that discuss this topic as well. Oh, and also, this, yeah, oh, Peter, there's one, really... yeah, and there's one, one, more, one more conference I'll mention that there's the first EMF conference is going on this, the first medical conference where there's like continuing medical credits is in September uh, in, um, in Aptos, California out here. Oh, it's going on when? It's in September. I think it's in the middle of September, early to mid-September. I think it's called like EMF conference or I think it's called EMF conference 2019. And it's in Aptos, wow. California. So that's great for like to educating okay. if, you're, if you're a doctor and you want to get up on this topic, that should be a good source of, you know, education. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Well, this is, uh, like I said, a lot of resources, great knowledge. I appreciate you coming. Thank you so much, Richard. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Thank you.